Yeah, at this point, it's gonna make me start to cry. It's turning into a therapy session. This one makes me a little emotional. <sighs> it's a pretty intense question. Who is that guy? Uh, <clears throat> I see a black female who is trying to do things that people have never done before. I see a non-traditional law student who started his legal career late in life. I see myself, who is now an attorney in the third year, which is kind of a scary thing to say. Beyond what I do, I am also an openly transgender associate at my firm. Wants to make the best out of this life that she can. That is who Ethereal is. I don't have a good answer to that. Not right now. Caitlin is one of my closest friends. She did ask me to be one of her bridesmaids. The feeling is very much reciprocated. I can't imagine my life without her in it, without any of the people that I work with. I like to be a good human being. I like to be polite to people. I joke that I'm the politest person that most people know. This is a quote from Ken Lee, who's a counsel in my group, who I ended up working with very closely, very early on. I talked to him on a daily basis about everything. This is a big deal for me. Um, I think that, you know, when I was little, I don't think people would have ever imagined that I would be where I am. Openness and vulnerability draw people in. I've found that people reciprocate when you offer it up. <laughs> wow, that's incredibly kind. Pro bono is such an important feature of the work that we do at the firm and a real passion of mine. When you see people that are that energized and that excited about the work that they do, you get excited. And so any opportunity that I have to work with John is just so exciting because I feel like he actually matches my energy. <laughs> Arcus is really meaningful to me. Arcus is our LGBTQ affinity group at Clifford Chance. I feel nothing but support in the work that I do with Arcus. It makes sure that there's a space for different types of people at our law firm. And that's something that Clifford Chance puts a huge priority on. It's really important to me to be part of the API affinity group and just to give back in any way I can. Clifford Chance looks beyond the paper, looks to what people have done before, they've had other professions, they've had other life experiences because it makes the firm better to have people who have been accountants, who've been bankers, who've been musicians come together with a shared passion for the law and serving clients. There's a number of people who have left and come back. That does distinguish the firm. I don't know a lot of stories at other law firms where that's been the case. The reason that I joined this firm is because it didn't just feel like a cookie cutter law firm to me. It felt like they were friends with each other, they knew each other, they wanted to work together. It's really been helpful to be able to go to people and say, hey, this is a place that is welcoming for you. This is a place that I think you would find a home. Maybe more than just a lawyer. I clearly have some, some very good friends and colleagues that trust me and that really do like me. This was really meaningful. I feel charged up to go see my colleagues and make them smile some more. Someone that will put all her time and energy into bringing people together. See somebody who's committed to others, who's a hard worker. I see somebody who's enough. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. It's a fantastic turnout. We have um, a great number of lawyers here. We have a lot of lawyers in Washington as well with Jessica. Um, there are a lot of students here, I believe, and also uh, online. So thanks, everybody, for spending time and coming and sharing um, your thoughts and um, questions with us. I'm Patrick. Uh, I'm a partner in our Sao Paulo office and the Capital Markets Group. Um, I'm also a member of our America's Hiring Committee and of our DNI Committee. 
Uh, super proud to be able to steer the conversation today. I'll do that with Jessica, who's down in Washington. She'll say hi in a minute. Uh, but first, I just want to acknowledge a couple things. We started with that video uh, because we think it's a great kind of um, tone setter for a candid and open discussion. I think there's no question of how candid it was. I, I wish they had some uh, tissues up here on the stage with us. Um, but um, we also just want to acknowledge that um, diversity is a very important topic for a lot of people. Uh, I think that means that everyone's experience with diversity is different. We have um, a panel here um, and we have some great questions and answers that we'll talk about. Uh, but we acknowledge that this is just going to be a very small sample of what diversity can look like at Big Law. Um, and so we want this to be a jumping off point for more discussions, more candid discussions. Uh, we also acknowledge that some of these topics are uh, somewhat uh, uncomfortable to talk about at times. Um, so we're, again, we're here to just share thoughts and, um, and be open with each other, um, you know, even on difficult topics, um, similarly to how I think um, the fantastic folks did in the video. Um, so with that, if that's all fine with everyone, I might pass it over to Jess to say hi in Washington. Um, and thank you all for joining us here in D.C. and in New York. I'm Jessica Springsteen, for those of you who don't know me. I'm a partner in the Energy and Infrastructure Group here in D.C. I'm a first-generation Peruvian American, and I'm also on the DNI Committee and Hiring Committee. Before Patrick introduces our esteemed panel, I want to remind all of you that we will have time for questions and answers at the end of our panel, and obviously during the reception. So I encourage you all to take advantage of both opportunities. With that, take it away, Patrick. Great, thanks. So let's meet our panel. Um, Rahima, if you'd like to go first. Hi, everyone. My name is Rahima. I'm a second year associate in the litigation and dispute resolution team. Um, I'm also a member of the AAPI subcommittee, which stands for the Asian American Pacific Islander subcommittee. And I'm really excited to be here with all of you today. Thanks very much, Daniel. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Justice. I'm a third year associate in the project finance group in the DC office. I summered with the firm in 2019, and I'm a member of the hiring committees and ARCUS, which is, as mentioned in the video, the firm's LGBTQ plus affinity group. Thanks very much, Kane. Hi, everyone. I'm Kane. I'm a seventh year not associate. I <laughs> manage the firm's brand, comms and marketing in the region. Um, I joined Clever Chance actually in Hong Kong in 2015, and um, yeah, I'm going to give you a, a perspective from uh, the business professional side this evening. Kamara, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Kamara Davis. I'm a third year transactional associate here in the New York office. Um, I summered at Clifford Chance, both by 1L and 2L summers, um, and I am a member of the Black and Latino subcommittee. Thanks very much. Teho. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Teho Chell. I'm a ninth year capital markets associate in our New York office. I too summered at Clifford Chance, although that's already 10 years ago or so. Um, just a little background about me, um, Korean from Korea, grew up in Korea, Japan, and Peru before coming to the States for college and um, law school. And here I am, so happy to be here. Thanks very much, and thanks for um, spending your time and sharing your very candid thoughts here uh, with so many people. That's um, very um, um, bold of you. Um, so let's open up the discussion with a personal question. Uh, maybe Rahim, if you'd like to go first. Um, when you were coming through the process, how important was it that a firm was focused on diversity? Yeah, I think that's a great question for me personally. Um, I have no lawyers in the family, so I was really overwhelmed by the whole process of OCI and just trying to keep the names of the different firms straight in my head when I went into interviews. Um, so for me, I think when I was thinking about diversity, it was kind of in the back of my mind and more so how I felt I connected to a person during the interview. So how comfortable I felt and noticing whether or not that person was really thinking about me as an individual rather than what they were reading about me on paper. And that's one of the reasons that for me, Clifford Chance stood out right away during the interview process alone because um, I had a conversation with Chris Morvillo, who's a partner in our litigation and dispute resolution team and you know just straight off the bat he was not focused on the resume the paper or anything like that he was asking me questions about myself and he actually asked me um where do you see yourself from 
like five to 10 years from now. And I was um, a little bit <laughs> caught off guard because I wasn't ready to answer that question yet. But it showed me that this person was already invested in what my future looked like. And so coming back and saying yes to Clifford Chance was an automatic yes for me. And that to me was valuing who I was as a whole person. And that's how I see diversity. Fantastic. So commitment to career, maybe more than diversity for you. Uh, Daniel, for you. Yeah, actually for me, kind of opposite from Rahima's approach, diversity was at the top of my list. So I was really fortunate uh, when I was interviewing that, you know, I got offers at good firms and I knew that wherever I went, I would be doing market leading work with good partners um, and have great clients. So I wanted something more than just that. And for me, that something more was a commitment to diversity. Um, you know, when I was looking into the details of it, I was trying to find a firm that, you know, did more than write nice blog posts for Black History Month and did more than put the pride flag uh, up on the website in June. And, you know, in a word, I wanted to get through the marketing and the brand. And I recognize the irony of saying that <laughs> sitting next to the brand guy up here, but can you guys do an amazing job? Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, I wanted to see what members of the organization were doing on the ground to not only attract diverse talent, but to retain it and to cultivate it here in house. Um, so those are the questions that I was asking during the recruitment process. Um, you know, I got really good answers. For example, the 1L diversity scholarship that we have, and there are tons of other initiatives and pipelines that the firm engages with to make sure that we're bringing in diverse talent um, at the junior level. But I don't want to idealize it, right? Like, to be really fair, there's still tons and tons of room for improvement, especially when you look at the senior levels um, of the firm. But again, to be very candid about that, that's the result of societal and structural inequities and inequalities that exist, you know, not only in the profession, but society at large. And to bring about that kind of change, it takes time. And that's why conversations like this, the difficult conversations, the uncomfortable conversations are so critically important. And that's why I think that having these sorts of conversations is one of my most important roles as a young associate at the firm. Fantastic. Thanks. So diversity important for you. Um, what do you think about the students who are coming through now? Do you think they have a similar approach to yours? I, I think so. I think that everyone in the room today is kind of a testament to that and the conversations that we'll have at the reception will bear that out as well. You know, people are really looking to find places that don't just talk the talk because everyone knows we have fantastic publicists and strategists and comms people that do the messaging really well. They want to see what the organizations are doing to have a real impact in the world. And maybe Rahima, Rahima, I'll come back to you. Um, now that you're on this side of the, the recruiting process, would you agree that, that, you know, kind of splitting the image from the experience is important for students these days? Yeah, definitely. And I try to keep that in mind when I'm, you know, conducting interviews. Um, something that I felt the level of comfort that was provided to me when I was interviewing with everybody at Clifford Chance, I try to carry that forward. So making someone who's feeling very anxious and nervous about a whole process that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Sometimes letting them know that they have the space to be a person and try to connect with me on a real level rather than talk about what GPA they have or what courses they've taken. While that may be interesting, I do want to know how they perceive themselves being at the firm and what it is they can bring to the table. So one example that stands out to me is when I was interviewing um, somebody for this upcoming summer, um, you know, I started the questions off with, how's your day going? And that allowed for this person to tell me that they're actually, you know, calling in or zooming in from Jordan. And so their day is actually, you know, night. And so it was a really good opener because it allowed for this person to connect with me and tell me, oh, I'm doing this kind of pro bono work in Jordan. And this is the type of global diversity that I hope Clifford Chance will support. And it allowed for us to move away from you know, what would be naturally like a recruitment pitch. It was talking about what this person's interests are and how they aligned very well with the firm. So keeping that in mind and allowing for people to have the space to, you know, be themselves outside of what they've curated on paper, I think is key for me. Fantastic. Thanks. Um, Jess, maybe over to you for the next question. Yes. So as a partner uh, on the hiring committee and after having done hundreds of interviews, I couldn't agree more. I completely agree with what Daniel and Rahima said. But moving past the sort of initial recruitment phase, let's talk about what the experience has actually been like since joining the law firm and working in big law. Teho, as one of the most senior panelists, since it's been 10 years since your summer, would you be able to take this question? 
Sure, Jessica. Um, I, I don't know if the students in the audience are all thinking of going to Dick Law. And if so, I don't want to scare any of you before you even start. But working in Big Law can be pretty tough. Um, you know, things will come at you pretty fast. Um, you know, hours can be long and unpredictable. Um, and also the stress and anxiety can at times be pretty overwhelming. Um, I can't speak for everybody, but at least for me, um, the added difficulty of being a minority in this kind of environment has been that, you know, not only on, like, on top of all the things that make working in Big Law you know, challenging, um, I always often or I often felt like I had to like worry about or worry about something else or something more, you know, that may be about fitting in, maybe about, you know, representing or speaking up in certain situations or just spending time wondering if, you know, something was an actual issue or if it was just a misunderstanding. Um, and, you know, a, a greater diversity or, you know, representation at a firm like this, I think, you know, the bet, you know, one benefit of that is, you know, it, it does lessen or it can help lessen and you know, smooth out some of the stressors, some of those stressors for somebody like me, um, you know, being able to speak, or at least I found that being able to speak with others who would look like me or, you know, have similar background or beliefs or, you know, experiences, I, you know, that, I found that to be very comforting and powerful. Um, you know, as Daniel alluded, um, there are still a lot of improvements to be made um, that as a firm that we can aspire to make. But in the you know past eight plus years that I've been with the firm, I definitely have noticed a greater representation at each level of the firm. Um, and not only that, I think also just the broader openness and commitment to talk about and tackle these issues, um, even if it's not comfortable or it can be uncomfortable. And I, I do think that's really important, right? Because attaining an ideal level of, you know, diversity or representation, you know, aspiration that we can have, and but that can take a long time. Um, but, you know, fostering an environment that allows us to feel comfortable enough to speak up and make mistakes and grow up or grow as a professional or person, I think, you know, that can help us hopefully get there one day. Um, you know, it's a little embarrassing for me to admit, um, especially in front of a lot of people that I've never met. Um, but I, I think at least until recently, I felt like, I, you know, I, everything was generally fine as long as, you know, these issues did not affect me personally. Um, or affect my day-to-day -day work or, you know, development as a lawyer. Um, and, you know, that's probably not enough, right? Um, it, you know, it, 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 and I, I do realize and I have sort of come to realize that I do need to put myself out there, you know, look beyond just me um, and, you know, be in a situation uncomfortable like this one for me um, and find ways to contribute. Um, and, you know, I think, whew, um, it's it, it, the, sorry, um, I think, you know, they are, um, I mean, I had, I had doubts about sort of, or some doubts about participating today. A, I don't like public speaking or speaking in front of people. Um, but, and also like there are a lot of, you know, colleagues who've thought about these issues a lot more, you know, acted on these um, issues a lot, you know, a lot more vigorous than I have. And also, it's not an easy topic to talk about. Um, and, you know, I, I was sort of afraid that I would say something not fully thought out or dumb or, you know, potentially offensive. You never know. Um, but here I am. And, you know, hopefully these kinds of conversations can, you know, help us sort of start and, you know, be a stepping stone for continued discussions and actions. Fantastic. So. Thank you. Uh, Rahima, you want to try this one? I'm going to need a repeat of the question. Okay, no, sure. Um, <laughs> Jess, you want to repeat? Yes, I was just saying moving past the recruitment phase and into your actual working at the law firm in big law, you know, what has changed? What are, what are you able to tell us about this transition and real life experience? Thank you. Yeah. No, I appreciate you rereading that. Um, I think with Clifford Chance from the summer experience going to being a full-time associate, 
Uh, my experiences around issues like diversity and challenging topics has translated very well. So it's not just um, all rosy during the summer and then it's not when you join. I think it's a very real approach that the firm has and that speaks to the kind of people we work with. One example that stands out in my mind is um, after Roe versus Wade was overturned, um, we had a women's coffee set up for the month and we decided to have a conversation and open the floor and talk about how people were feeling across the firm. And I know it was affecting people differently. Um, for me personally, in a group of junior associates, we tried having you know a different perspective on it, thinking about what is the reproductive justice healthcare that we can look at internally? How can we support our own staff and our own attorneys when people are thinking about fertility treatments or family planning? And I think it was a really eye-opening moment for me going into this coffee where I was a first year associate and there were people all the way through counsel and partner and I still felt okay, supported and comfortable sharing my opinions. And actually that's not even where the conversation stopped. People were encouraged to reach out to me and provide me with resources and think about what might the next steps be for Clifford Chance in the Americas with regard to this issue. Very good. Um, yeah, I know that for my own career development support and, and not just support on an individual level from individual lawyers, but the feeling that the firm is behind you and the firm is behind your success um, has been really um, instrumental and fantastic. Um, drilling down a little bit on support, resources, what kind of specific resources do you think you, you, you've seen in that effort at least that was helpful? So something that I was unaware of at the time was that for Clifford Chance in the UK, um, the firm has already approached this topic and is already looking at what types of support they can provide to people within the firm. So there's already a framework set up and somebody reached out and gave me that resource. So we already have something to look to when thinking about how we want to model this for ourselves in the Americas. And I personally am really excited to see where the firm takes that and how we can employ having some, you know, some type of a framework for our associates and business professionals here where we feel supported and we approach reproductive health care outside of just, you know, what can we do in the pro bono space, but what can we do to support the people here? Very good. Um, and now on an individual level, um, support, sponsorships, um, mentorships, uh, relationships that you've had here that have been very valuable for you. Uh, talk about that for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to shout someone out and I hope they're not going to get upset. But I don't know if you've had the great pleasure of meeting MJ Yoon, but she is an absolute champion of every person that she's ever come in contact with. I remember when I joined the firm, she actually made it a point to reach out to me and said, you know, as a woman of color joining the firm, I want you to know that you have somebody in your corner who's going to support you. So you can come to me with anything that you're experiencing or if you want to talk through any issues. But, um, and I, I was like, so, you know, awestruck. I was like, she's incredible. I've seen her speak. This is so cool. Um, and I thought that would be kind of the conversation and that's where it would end. But actually MJ reached out to me a couple months later, only having known me for such a short span of time. And she said, you know, it's um, AAPI History Month and we need a keynote speaker and I trust you. So you can find the keynote speaker and me as a first year associate, I was just like, really me? <laughs> I've been here for like five seconds. <laughs> um, but what that spoke to was the fact that MJ had developed a trust in me and the kind of professional that I was, but also who I was personally. And she allowed for me to take this forward and see it through. And her support in me, that is the kind of mentorship that I think um, you can't really organize or plan. That just comes with finding incredible people, which Clifford Chance is very good at doing. So um, that will forever live on in my memory as both a mortifying and wonderful experience. <laughs> oh, and also very quickly, the event was um, we invited Dr. Karen Korematsu. And if, for those of you who don't know, she is the daughter of Fred Korematsu from Korematsu versus United States. So the fact that we were able to champion that together and bring that to Clifford Chance was super cool. And, and that's the end. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, fantastic. And MJ is amazing. Um, Kamar, uh, let's bring you in on this one. Um, mentors, sponsors, relationships that you think have been great for you. Sure. Thank you, Patrick. Um, so like Bahima, I have also had a number of great mentors, both 
um, formal and informal here at Clifford Chance. Um, my career development mentor is Sarah Jones, who is the global head of corporate of the corporate group. Um, and Sarah has just gone above and beyond to give me excellent advice, to push me to take on new challenges and to go outside of my comfort zone. Um, every month we try to meet up for coffee and I get to talk to her about the deals that I'm on and we can talk about how I can continue to grow in my role. Um, but we also have fun conversations about our dogs and our kids and vacation, <laughs> all that stuff. Um, but Sarah has just been instrumental to my growth here and I'm really grateful to have her. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't also mention Edwin Ramirez, who I think is here. Um, <laughs> and I wanna give him a shout out as well because he has become somewhat of an informal mentor of mine in the group that I hope to join in the spring. Um, I always feel like can, I can go to Edwin and ask him the questions I think are kind of dumb about the work that we're, we're doing. Um, but I also feel like I could go to him whenever I'm feeling overwhelmed. In fact, I was in his office this morning for like 20 minutes ranting about deadlines. Um, but it's so important to have um, a support group, um, a support system in our jobs. Um, you know, like my fellow panelists have already mentioned, this job is no cakewalk. Um, it's very difficult and stressful. Um, so having that system in place and um, fostering those relationships is essential to success. Thank you very much. Daniel? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I also, like everyone else that's spoken, have been extremely fortunate um, in getting just the best mentors. So my formal career development mentor is Peter Hughes um, from the DC office, and we work together literally every single day um, on deals. So I'm able to get real time substantive feedback to what it is that I'm doing. And that's been truly invaluable um, to my growth as a junior attorney. Um, but I also have to shout out um, our lovely co-moderator in DC, Jessica Springsteen, a colleague in the projects group. Um, Jessica is, I mean, she's an icon truly in every sense of the word. Um, but Jessica has given, <laughs> I'm, I, I didn't know what she did, but I'm sure that it was iconic. Um, so <laughs> but Jessica has really given me the space to grow in ways that I never expected I would be able to. Um, even as you know, a first and second year attorney, she let me take the lead on transactions. She let me take the lead on drafting central financing documents, on interacting with clients directly. Um, like Kamara said, you know, sometimes these experiences can be mortifying. Um, there have been times where I've questioned every decision that I ever made that led me to get to that point. Um, but then I just take a deep breath and ground myself and remind myself that Jessica has seen me work before and she knows that I have the ability to take charge and complete the task in a way that's both client friendly and good for the firm, or she wouldn't have given me the task. Also, it's important that, you know, I know I have the full support of my group across the CC network, which is really, really critical as well. Um, and just on a more personal note, um, and I'm not going to get too heavy, but I did have a really difficult um, year last year and um, to the point that it began to interfere with my work, but I felt totally comfortable going to Jessica and having really frank, candid and honest conversations about what was going on, how it was impacting me um, and getting her advice on how I could move forward. So, you know, I don't take for granted the fact that Jessica's both an amazing professional mentor, but she's also a really great personal mentor. So I'm really happy and proud to count her among my friends as well. Fantastic. Yes, we are wonderfully fortunate to to have Jess in the firm. If folks haven't met her, seek her out. Um, so let's shift a little bit from looking back to looking towards the future a little bit. Um, I think everyone here wants to make real progress in this area, uh, but that takes time. That takes uh, specific measures. Um, so uh, maybe Kamara, could you talk about, make some suggestions for what you'd expect to see from a firm that is pushing forward on diversity? Sure, Patrick. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I was able to summer both my 1L and 2L summers. Um, and that was because I was recruited through a program called the Diverse Attorneys Pipeline Program, or DAP. 
Um, and DAP is a program that was founded by two diverse former attorneys that had kind of made it their mission to get more women of color into big law as early as 1L. Um, and although the program is still gaining traction in New York, it's based in the Midwest, um, I'm really grateful that the firm was one of the early supporters of the program because if they weren't, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you guys today. Um, since then, the firm has also gone on to, um, to establish its uh, diversity scholarship program as well, um, which is all great. Um, to be honest, um, you know, being a part of these programs or participating in these programs is not something that's unique to Clipper Chance. I think all firms are starting to focus more on diversity and inclusion. Um, but something that I think sets um, the firm apart from everyone else is how they are intentional about their approach. So for example, when I came in as a Waddell summer law clerk, um, I honestly didn't know what to expect. Um, I'm sure some of the people in the room have heard about or experienced um, the fact that there is a little bit of a stigma that comes with um, summer associates who come in to a firm through a diversity program or through a diversity scholarship. Um, and I honestly, coming into this, was worried that I would be treated differently um, or that people would think that I wasn't as competent as the other summer law clerks because I had come in through one of these programs. Um, I can honestly say that that is not what my experience was. It was the complete opposite. Um, I had the same opportunities as everybody else. And honestly, I also um, had the same expectations placed on me as well. <laughs> I mean, I really wanted to be like, I'm just a 1L, calm down, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but I felt included. I felt like I belonged. Um, and so, you know, I'm really grateful for that. And I also wanted to highlight another program that I was able to participate in um, last summer, which was the um, the New York City Bar's uh, Leadership Associate Leadership Institute, um, which is a program that is more focused on professional development for junior associates. Um, I have gotten so many takeaways from that program that I still use today. Um, and so again, very happy that I was able to be, participate and that the firm sponsored me and allowed me to um, be a part of that. So I think that going forward, going back to your question, I, I think that the firm should continue to support these programs and to continue to take that approach um, in the future. Great, thank you very much. Um, support the programs, promote the programs, and folks who know about the programs, promote the programs for others that um, they think could, could, could be candidates. Um, but let's turn up the heat a little bit. Um, what's big law not doing enough of? Um, Kane, uh, you get the heat. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Patrick. Um, <laughs> well, I think, first of all, it's unique for, for me to be up here as um, you know, head of brand. It's very different to what we would normally do in this in this space. We would normally have attorney, uh, attorneys talk about their experiences. And I, I always say when people ask me what I do is like I'm in the business of humanizing um, the work that our attorneys do. So no offense, Daniel, but that's what we do as marketers. Um, but as a firm, we market our people and, and our clients buy the services or they buy our people really and those relationships count. Um, you've heard some really genuine stories here. Um, and, and I know, you know, acknowledging none of these are easy things to talk about, partially if we don't want to speak public speaking, but also the, the, the subject matter itself is deeply personal and bringing that to work is important. Um, in many ways when, when we're humanizing what we do. Um, you know, we watched the video at the start of the session here and it dawned on me, I thought about a conversation, one of our partners that's in the room here, Emily Wicker said to me, you know, we need to install one of those mirrors on every floor. We need to start giving people that feedback and, because we, we only do that really, unfortunately, when they leave the firm perhaps or maybe in memoriam or things like that. And that human element is really important. So 
quickly back to your question. Um, I think for industry, big law, we need to keep having these conversations and we need to dive deeper and we need to get super uncomfortable. Uh, that's super important for us. And I attended um, an industry event last week with Weber Shandwick, which is a global PR firm, and they, they've assembled a, a team of advisors that guide multinationals, law firms, like other organizations, uh, governments, politicians on you know, navigating through this environment that we're in, which is highly politicized. It is you know, a war around culture in many ways. And, and it's really about understanding that the session was really about understanding how to navigate through that. And so I wanted to sort of talk about, no offense to my fellow panelists, but it was a really impressive panel. There was a, a, the vice president for communications for um, Vice President Harris, and it was there was a CEO of Blackbird AI, which is an AI company that actually scours conversations globally, not just media monitoring, not just the internet, the dark web, um, a lot of things that uh, can really help shape sentiment in communities. Uh, and there was also a uh, president of the, I think I just, I wrote this down because I wouldn't remember it, uh, the Minority AIDS Council, which is a group that uh, advocates for those living with HIV uh, and works with governments and politicians to make sure that they get the, the care that they want. So I bring that up because it's diverse views and the key takeaway and it's the key takeaway for big law is to lead and to be able to progress as an industry and to be able to progress as a firm, our leaders need to take stock of, stock of the firm's values. And I think you know, you're know you capturing some of that here today, listening to our people, and also then look at their stakeholders. And when I say that, I mean our clients, the people we work for, uh, our people, our own colleagues, and some of who are in the room and our you know, potential recruits, so also some of you uh, in the room here and online, and understand what their values are themselves, what, what they seek out, what they want to be part of, and really be forensic about that. And then to move forward, have conversations with those people, even if they're difficult conversations. The important thing is that you can, in a perfect world, we align on values, we align on what's important to us, but good people and the people that we seek out to uh, to work with and spend most of our time with, as everyone said here, um, we ha you have to be aligned uh, in your core values and your moral compass and all of those things. And the only way to get to that is to actually have the conversations. That's great. Thank you. Um, you know, and I might add as well, um, you know, we hear these words retention, advancement. Um, I, I think um, those are super important for minorities. You know, we, we the recruiting teams focus on recruiting, getting folks into the firm, getting folks into the industry. Um, but I think honestly, the pipeline is um, is lacking just across the country. And this isn't a, you know, a, our firm thing or another firm thing. It's an industry thing. Um, and so, you know, in my view, I think what students need to see are folks like them who have come through and done well and stayed there and progressed. Um, so for me, it would be um, recruiting and, and really advancement. Um, Jess, any any thoughts from down that way? So I think we're going to switch gears a little bit. So unfortunately, it seems that the catalyst for this increased focus on DEI issues um, has been the ongoing crimes across the United States, motivated by discrimination and hate. Kane, do you think you could talk about how this has personally affected you at home and coming to work? Of course. Yeah. I'm seem to be getting all of the pretty tough questions here, but you're the comms guy. Yeah, sure. No problem, everyone. Um, no, in my role, and I've talked about conversations, you know, I bear witness to so many of these conversations with our leadership teams, with our attorneys, um, you know, our business professionals. A lot of the conversations, uh, so Rahima spoke about Roe v. Wade. It was a really tough time for us, I think. Uh, we are a really diverse population, and we all have views, opinions, different levels of knowledge. And those conversations I, I, I bore witness to, but I also saw the other side of it. And as a brand manager, you know, it's my job to 
I guess, be the conscious of the firm and conscience of the firm and um, really think about do we respond publicly and guide our leaders as to how we may do that and do it tactfully that aligns with our values, but also pays respect to, you know, we appreciate diversity of thought. And that's great. And it all, you can wrap it up. I mean, Brand, it, you can wrap it up in a nice bow and say that's cool. Um, but what that actually does to your question is it allows me to almost be agnostic or Switzerland and, you know, I can give best guidance in terms of best practice from a comms perspective and it kind of allows me to ignore the impact, the personal impact of things that are happening in many cases and that's a real challenge I speak to my team about as well when, when we're writing communications for different groups and teams. How hard is it to, you know, communicate a message when there's so much emotion attached to it. And so clearly I'm not a New Yorker, if you can tell from the accent, I, um, but I do ride the train, I ride the subway to work um, like a New Yorker. I don't make eye contact with anyone. I don't put my bag on the ground, all of those things. Um, and I recalled, I was talking to a colleague actually, I think it was late last year, and I told her a story about I just rode from East Village, I'm on the subway, I've got my headphones in, I'm literally minding, maybe doing Wordle, um, minding my own business. And I see people or sense people start looking at me and it's like the whole carriage and I'm like, something's on. Turn off my one of my headphones and I can hear someone yelling like homophobic slurs and I was going to actually imitate the accent, but I'm not gonna do that because I can't do a great one. But it was, and I'm not gonna say the words that were said, but really personal, like aggressive homophobic slurs. And it dawned on me at that time, I'm sitting in a carriage and everyone assumes this person's talking to me. And it brought me back to when I was say 12, 13 years old, closeted, feeling really ashamed of who I was and, you know, wanting to kind of shrivel up and, and be invisible basically. And I only tell you this story not to, no one needs to get the Kleenex out. I'm not trying to draw attention to what actually happened, but I relayed this story as soon as I got into work. I walked into work, I got into the meet, into a meeting, straight away my colleague said, what's up? And I told the story and it dawned on me that we've created a space here that is a really safe space and absolutely would not have existed, you know, years and years ago when you were, when you were a trainee, Teho, or when I first entered, uh, entered the industry. Um, and that was a really unique thing. And I just want to give one more example, if you'll, you'll bear with me around, you know, I've talked about conversations. Um, we manage media and part of what we do in that role is, you know, interview, interviewing or sitting with our leaders as they speak to journalists. And sometimes, you know, we're all human. Sometimes our, our leaders say things um, that maybe would be misinterpreted or they shouldn't say, and we do quote checks. And my fabulous teammate, Michael, called me after a, an interview one day and said, look, and a lead, one of our leaders, I won't use the name, said to the journalist, you know, in, we, we need more black partners. And okay, that's a statement. It was a little shocking to me. I'm like, thank you for mentioning it. Let's speak to the journalist. Maybe we can, we can ch change the quote. And then I thought to myself, it brought me back to 2020 and the George Floyd murders and me feeling just so uncomfortable. As Teho said, like not knowing if, if I was going to say something that was offensive or not even knowing how to ask the question. And then I thought, I'm going to call Devika, who is a, a partner of ours and global head of the tech group. And I called her up and stumbled over my words and she was like, spit it out. What, what is it? And I told her the scenario. And she said, that's a really good quote. I'm like, can, can a partner use that word? Is it, a, is it like aggressive or can you just say we need more black partners? She said, well, you know what it is? We actually need more Asian partners and we need more uh, Latino partners and we need more black partners. We need more female partners. So can we kind of push it, push the agenda a little bit? And I share that story because again, it was a, an open space. I could call a very senior team member she was without ego, listened, answered my question, but then also kind of helped me broaden my thinking as well. And, you know, I was fixated on one thing professionally and that opened up a whole, you know, train of thought around, you know, 
what can we do to push more? And I think that's that sort of environment I just wanted to share because that's a that's a, that's a big thing for us, and that's something that didn't always exist, and I and I, I'm sure it doesn't in many firms. That's great, um, and it's great that it exists here. But let's talk about the folks we work for. Uh, what about our clients? Do they get it? Are they sensitive to 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 you know a cane who came into the office from the train that day? Okay, so another question for me. I am um, <laughs> the comms guy. Yeah, exactly. No, it's a good one. And all right, so I'm in comms. So little lesson here. I'm going to speak in headlines. So your takeaway is that you know in general, people, clients, people want to work with people that look like them or look and are like the people that they live with and that are in their communities. And if you use that as the basis of conversation around clients and diversity, it's a given that we would have to you know, front up and be diverse. And that that is, you know, we see the benefits, the, the benefits of uh, diversity of thought, and we say that and people's different backgrounds and experiences. But also when you're building relationships, um, it's critical that you're, you know, you're finding your people. And from a client perspective, I think we've we've um, we've come from a place where it was almost a badge of honor. And I think we will all probably recall a couple of years ago, maybe five years or more ago, where, you know, having a diverse team or win, winning an award was a real badge of honor and it really made you stand out. We're in a very different space now. I think it's an expectation. And um, I think that's a really great thing because of what it does do is allows uh, for us to have more conversations that are real and genuine with the people that we provide services for. And, you know, if I think about um, the different opportunities that that can create, um, you know, an example that I, I think is really great, and I'm also a member of the Arcus um, affinity group at the firm, we run an annual Pride Art, Art event. So this is your plug to keep, I think it's June 21st free. Uh, in New York and 14th in um, in DC, but we run an annual event. It's a client event, and you know we partner around the world with clients on that. And so Glamazon, which is Amazon LGBT group, works with us. That they have got an exhibition at the moment in Sydney for World Pride, which is so cool. Uh, a big client of ours, J.P. Morgan, uh, have partnered with us in Tokyo of all places as well. A very conservative um, uh, environment, and we continue to build those relationships out. And so just doubling back a little and thinking about internally and, and, and the benefit that type of interaction has, we have a steering group committee for Pride Art this year for Arcus and we had our team for the first time in Warsaw in Poland is running an, an LGBT art exhibition this year. How cool is that? And we're on our, week, uh, on our uh, three weekly call and they're like, we, can we speak to someone? We don't know how to approach clients about this. How do we do this? And luckily, we've hosted events in Tokyo. We've done LGBT events in mainland China, of all places, in Hong Kong. And you know, we have an active Arcus group in the Middle East. And to be able to draw on that network is just incredibly powerful. It's kind of a double down on our fantastic global network. That's yeah. great. Um, Teho, you want to take a look, uh, take take a shot at um, uh, what you're seeing from clients? Yeah, no, of course. And Kane, that's super impressive and interesting. Um, also good to know because I didn't know about that before. Um, I, you know, from my experience, I, you know, clients do care. Um, as many of you are aware, and if you're students, you may not, but clients do ask about you know DEI metrics of the law firms that they work with. In the past few years, that you know those requests have sort of evolved and you know expanded to not just asking about hey, like how diverse is your you know firm or how diverse is the matter team that's working on our matters. But also, you know, how equitable and inclusive the firm is. So they they would be asking, you know, additional information about attrition rates among, um, you know, different groups of attorneys, um, you know, origination credits. So you know, it's it's it, it, it is at the forefront of their mind, and you know, they they you know, we, we also have to remember that they themselves are sort of you know working through these issues and learning and you know, thinking about, and they're looking internally and also externally and finding opportunities to work with you know like Kane said with our firm and others and you know opportunities to sort of collaborate so I think that that's that's you know very apparent um, and you know from 
least my experience, it seems like, and you know, as Kane aptly put, um, you know, they, the clients, you know, they're individuals too, right? They they do want to see, you know, similar values and you know diversity that you know within the organizations that they work with, and I, I think that's totally understandable. Thanks a lot, um, Jess. Completely. Uh, my clients that do business in Latin America uh, in the energy and infrastructure space are keenly aware of the lawyer gender gap. Uh, for many years, I was one of the few women sitting at the negotiating table, oftentimes confused for, I don't know, being a paralegal or, or some other person in the room. But I really do think things are shifting. Um, as you pointed out, Teho, clients have actually been key drivers for this change. They've been many instances put their good intentions into concrete actions like requiring questionnaires when uh, being asked to pitch from panel or holding you accountable when you send an RFP with an incredibly diverse group of people. And then when you do the deal, none of those people are on the actual deal. Uh, so I think this is really important for us to, to recognize that our clients are trying to push the needle forward and, um, you know, require a reflection of what they are actually asking of themselves internally. Patrick, I think you're up. Thank you very much. Um, so we're winding down. Uh, we've been talking about diversity, obviously, but at big law, I think we've also heard um, there are a lot of things that come at you very rapidly. So, you know, we're not focused on any one single issue. No one can really operate well. So uh, maybe Rahima will come back to you. Um, what are some other areas that are important for you other than diversity to um, kind of uh, make your life happier here at the firm? Yeah, that's a great question. I think personally, I would be a student for life if I could be and didn't have to worry about the loans. I think I'd keep going back for degree after degree because I just love being around different topics, learning new things. And I think that's part of what makes uh, working at Clifford Chance very exciting. But also, I think, especially in litigation, we have such an incredible wealth of people with different interests and knowledge. So like we have, you know, professionally trained chefs, people who sing and are in the choir, like we just have people who have things outside of work. And that is so important to maintain um, just a happy and healthy relationship, not with just yourself, but with your peers and your colleagues. The fact that you know, Emily and I share books constantly and we have a book exchange going. Um, it's a great way for me to connect with people, but also see them as a whole person outside of work. And that I think further enriches my life so much. So to answer your question, being a full whole individual outside of work, is definitely the key to happiness. Okay, great. Um, although I don't know if that's inclusive of those of us who don't have a very well-rounded life, but it's okay. <laughs> no one wants to hear me sing in the choir, right? Um, so, uh, Daniel, um, how about you? Um, you're going to close it up for us here with the, uh, uh, on the panel. What other areas of your life um, or what other areas of your life here at the firm um, uh, are, are important for you? Yeah, so I think I'm going to kind of rehash a bit what Rahima said, but I think it's really, it's culture, right? We talk about culture all the time at CC. Everyone at every firm talks about culture all the time, um, but kind of on the theme of what I've been talking about the whole night, like cut through the corporate speak, what does that really mean? Well, for me, it means that I'm more than the billable hour. I'm more than just the revenue that I'm bringing into the firm. And that's something that in my group is really respected, right? Because in order to show up as your best self at work, you have to be your best self outside of work and you have to be able to strike that balance. And that's something that I found has been really, really respected um, in, in my group. So that's what's most important to me. Fantastic. Thanks. So these are our questions. I think we're going to go to um, uh, Q and A um, pretty soon. Um, but I, I just wanted to kind of, you know, give my sense that um, it sounds like what everyone's saying is that everyone's just different. You know, you have different views on how you look at diversity, different views on how you look at your time here in the firm. Um, but I, I think we're um, luckily in a great place where everyone just sees each other as people, kind of part of the same team. Um, so if we can keep that up, that would be really great. Um, Jess, should we, um, uh, you got any questions there in DC? 
Well, first, I think we want to say thank you to all of you for listening to us. I know we've talked a lot, uh, so we want to leave some room for questions and answers to the extent that you have any here in D.C. or in New York. So I can't see the folks in New York, so Patrick, you'll have to guide me, but we'll start here in D.C. since you guys have been taking the lead all night. Any questions from the audience for, for anyone? If not, we can... How about in... Yes. Hello, everyone. Thank you for hosting us. I'm Gant, a 1L at Georgetown Law. Uh, it's wonderful to hear all your um, experiences and with diversity and being uh, diverse myself. It's, it's wonderful to hear your stories. I wanted to hear more about perhaps, I don't know how to coin it, but maybe the instrumental value of diversity. Many times, our diversity adds value on the table, being able to read the room differently. In some cultures, a yes is a no, a no is a yes, or sometimes okay. If somebody just says okay, that just means terrible. But maybe uh, the rest might see it as, oh, we're doing fine. So just if you could share any story that kind of could mirror this idea that diversity does have that also added value that you can bring on the table. Thank you. So Patrick, if it's okay with you, um, I can try to answer that and then open it up to the floor over there. Sure. So um, I work in a Latin American practice for energy and infrastructure that was um, co-created by uh, our partner Fabrizio Longin. And he was really focused on sort of meeting the needs of our clients, which was having fully Spanish-speaking teams who were culturally fluent and could read the room and go down to Latin America and sit down for hours talking about, you know, soccer or whatever it may be, football, sorry. Um, and, you know, in, in, not, in doing business in a different way. And it really became our key differentiator. It, not many firms, I don't think any, can actually do that where he said, you know, yes means no. And I tell my husband in English, the word fine in Spanish does not mean okay. It means <laughs> bad things. And so and, and so that is really something that is unique and special. And that's the value because at the end of the day, we got the deals and this is a business. And so I think um, it is important to recognize the value that diversity brings. And that's just one example. Patrick, do you want to ask the panelists or do you want to offer your views? Sure. No more questions in uh, DC. Okay. Any questions here in New York? Oh, don't be shy. MJ. <laughs> I, I... Thank you, Juan. Daniel, you said that diversity was a really important factor in choosing a law firm. Um, that's, you know, having worked here for the past three years, like, how, how did we do? There's definitely been improvement. I think it's great. You know, like my group, when I joined, there were three female partners and one male partner, you know, that was to me a great indicator. And then as I've stayed here, I've seen the incoming classes become more and more diverse. People are more and more willing to have these sorts of conversations. So I think that we're doing well now, um, but we have to continue on this trajectory and not ever get to the point where we're resting on our laurels and complacent. Anyone? Oh, sure. Hey, Sarah. I'll close it out because we're running long. Okay. <laughs> um, what, because we've been talking about all night that this is a jumping off point um, and the importance is just continuing to talk. So um, Rahim, I'm going to turn the heat up on you because we the flame was on Kane all night long. Um, what do you hope tonight accomplishes? That's a great question, and it's so open-ended. I could really take it anywhere. <laughs> um, I think from the point of view where I am, um, as somebody who's just started her career, what I've started to realize is that my confidence and my ability to grow comes from what people invest in me. So 
what that means to me is when people like MJ or Minji will give me ownership of certain things and guide me through different aspects of being involved at the firm outside of just my billable work, but the billable work as well. And I think that we could do a better job at it for um, the senior associates at, or mid-level associates to turn to the junior associates and say, I want you to take ownership of this or giving me the opportunity to add to what people are saying, just like today for you to invite me here and have me speak, this adds value to, well, the way I see it is if I was in the seat of a law student right now in the room, that would have made a difference to me in the recruiting process hearing all of this. And so it's really, really important that the people that you work with continue to drive that change. And I think that can be something as simple as asking people to be involved in different ways on projects outside of work, anything. And I think it just makes such a difference. Like I, I'm so much more confident in, in what I do at work because I've had people trust me and let me take the reins. Great, any other questions, Alex? Did anything come through on the chat? Nothing on the chat, Patrick. Nothing on the chat. No more? Oh, we've got one more. Great. Hi, uh, my name is Mermina. I'm a 1L at Cardozo. Um, I just had a question about, it's pretty general, about the affinity groups and maybe like what initiatives you guys are working on and what, what are some of the goals um, that each affinity group or network focuses on? Um, a great, great question. Long list. Um, let's do that over drinks. Um, anything else? Yeah, front. Thank you so much to the panelists. My name is Joanne Ling, and I'm also a one L at Cardozo. And something that I've been grappling with as a student, as a one L, as a first generation student, when I'm applying to these DEI programs, is What's the longevity of these programs 10 years from now? When does DEI become synonymous with just recruitment beyond its own particular ideals of trying to target these students? Um, and how you think, both Clifford Chance, but also big law in general, how you see that going and how, as lawyers, you can try to gear that or how you can try to steer that conversation. Thank you. That's a gamble. Um, Maybe Kane, you want to take that? It's more heat for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah. I'm shameless. No, not at all. No, and I can talk broadly, I think. Um, and it's more around what you've heard here this evening around, you know, the change that we've seen uh, over the years. And I think I, our global head of inclusion, Tin and Brady, um, you know, he is from Ireland. He travels the world and has those conversations with our people to get to understand, you know, what are the drivers for, you know, for inclusion in each region. And he's always said something that sticks with me, which is, you know, we have diversity targets, but we only have them so we can move them when we reach them and we keep pushing and we keep pushing. And he talks about the fact that this is a campaign and it's a campaign that never stops. And I think if you think about the discussions that we're having this evening, it is not just about gender. It is around a whole range of different aspects of diversity. And I think we can expect certainly in the legal industry, but I think across um, all business um, and beyond, um, you know, a continued evolution. And there'll be more and more um, there'll be more, we'll be pushing and the targets will get further and further away as we keep going. So it's my hope, certainly, um, that, you know, there's no end to that. Yeah, I think um, Sarah Posner, head of recruiting, can speak from the, obviously, from the recruiting perspective. And um, Joanne, is that your name? Yeah, we'll chat more. I would love to chat more. Um, uh, but we don't lower the bar. So I think, again, an ongoing theme of tonight has been um, finding the fit, finding the people, um, and that infiltrates recruitment that fit into the culture of this firm and fit into the culture. And this is you know, a small sampling of the representation of what the culture here at Clipper Chance looks like. And hopefully you'll, experiencing, you'll experience that more when we step in the other room and you got to talk to more of 
our attorneys and our business professionals and some of our incoming summers or former summers. Um, but we we look at it um, holistically and we don't um, look at it through, a, we don't look at recruitment through a diversity lens. Um, the standard is still high um, and the standard is still high to look, like Davika said in the video, beyond the paper, looking at the person. Um, and there are so many members of the committee that, <laughs> that are sitting here that can nod their head and agree with me, Patrick. <laughs> um, so I think if that answers your question, but we can, again, certainly talk more. And I know people are probably really restless to get to the drinks and the appetizers and DC. Um, so again, like Patrick and Jessica said, and everyone, thank you all so much for coming. Um, and this Hi, is- Sarah, I just want to flag oh. that a question came through the chat. Um, Hi, my name is Mackenzie. I am 2L at Texas Law. Is there an affinity group for a disability? Yeah, this is one I'm happy to talk about. I know the answer to that. There absolutely is. Um, we have a global affinity group uh, called Enable uh, and that we uh, run a number of activities into the earlier question, like the, the list of activities across all of our groups, speak to all of us uh, in the networking afterwards. But um, we celebrate um, and recognize uh, International Day for Persons with Disabilities. And there is a range of activities that we undertake as a firm. There's training, education, development, and a personal an anecdote quickly, I do know we are going to cocktails, is um, you know, in our digital marketing team, we have a team member that controls our social media that's hearing impaired. And I would have never have known that there is a certain convention for how you use hashtags on social media so that people with machine uh, operated listening devices can actually read hashtags. And so that sharing that type of knowledge and people sharing their own stories has really changed. Um, it's changed the way that we look at things. Um, but to answer your question very simply, yes, we have an enable group. And um, I think there's information on the website about that as well. Okay, thanks. All right, Sarah's gonna kill us if we don't get out of here. Um, so thank you to the panel. Thanks everyone here in DC as well. Thank you everybody. And the students. And let's, um, let's keep the conversation going. Thank you.